enjoy my work and you enjoy my frameworks, I'm running a weekly poker class. They have been extremely well received so far. In the classes, I go heavy into everything poker, in every spot. I talk about exploitative line, how we build dynamic ranges based off of the player that we're up against, where the pool's ranges are weak, where the pool's ranges are strong. We talk about timing tells, how we use our frameworks to break down ranges in every spot where our opponents are vulnerable, how we can manipulate their range through bet sizing and timing, player profile, pre-flop, post-flop, mental game, you name it. If you can just find one or two concepts per class, you will have a meteoric rise in your win rate and your results will certainly benefit. Every class is one and a half hours for 75 US dollars. All the classes have a multiple choice interactive element to them. Whether you attend the live class or you purchase the recordings, you can follow along and track your progress. When you're ready to take your game to the next level, check out the Discord, send me a message. We'd be happy to have you. And I'm sure that after the first class, you'll agree. You'll be happy that you came. Take care, guys. What's up, guys? Play it Smart here, back with another video. Today, we are going to be playing some 500s. Gonna make an effort to play my hands first and then we will talk about them after. It's important whenever you sit down at a new table to try to understand who the recreational might be. There's always going to be clues. This player not sitting full stacked. Could definitely be a recreational. It's important whenever you're playing different stakes that you understand that your game should be relatively the same. Like the way I would play 10k no limit would be very similar to how I play 500 no limit, which would be very similar to how I play 10 no limit. The only, the differences would be I might have more exploits in terms of taking different hands, like putting more hands into bluffs or to calls depending on the stake or the opponent, but my overall general strategy in game is going to be the same. It's just going to be good, solid, strong poker. So we have identified the recreational. Gonna make a note. And we're gonna be looking to see what sizing he uses, what, what ranges he might be playing, and what are some of the exploits that we can do to counter him. Same with all the regulars, but spend some extra attention against the recreational since he's going to be making larger mistakes than the regulars. Such as this, there's no hand that he should be check jamming here. It's really important that you tailor your strategy to get involved with the recreational player as much as you can. So here in this three-way pot, It's important to look at sizings. You can still learn and be perspicacious in hands that you're not playing to gain an edge. You should be seeing how players are playing. You don't need to be in the hand. 
especially true in these normal tables or in live poker. Every hand you should be very aware of what's going on and what players are doing, and what you think that they're doing, or what they might try to do. So here, right away, we see a very large bet in a three-way spot like this, which don't think is going to be a great play with too many parts of your opponent's range, just because you want them to continue when you have the value, and when you're bluffing, you're risking quite a bit, and you're against two ranges. But nothing that was like egregious or anything. It's not like he went for an overbet. This player's posting is always a good sign. Definitely going to isolate this. Playing against a 100% range and a likely weak range, King Kanasu is going to fit, uh, play quite well. I'm also out of position, so my hand really benefits from getting this player to fold. And winning the three and a half big blinds is a completely acceptable result there. This player is also a recreational. It's important to note how this player is playing. King Deuce is too weak to isolate, especially at this low pot to stack ratio, where I can just get limp jammed on or I get three bet. Not good enough. I think King six or seven would be my cutoff point. Really important to widen your range. Like I said, against this player. Even though he only has 18 blinds, he's still going to play that stack depth, making a bunch of mistakes, and so it's important to get involved with him. Here, just going to fold with pocket force here to a 3x. These players can still squeeze behind, and this player is still shallow that he can also back jam. And so when I'm not guaranteed to see a flop, I think that these pairs really suffer. If he made it a min raise or even 2.5x, I could definitely consider getting in there, or if I was in later position. But like this player now has a very profitable squeeze situation. This player has a very profitable jam situation, and so I don't want to get sandwiched. So I have to just avoid the spot before it happens. When you fold, you always flop the set, the way that the RNG works. <laughs> really important to be taking notes of like the sizings here, like if this player starts bombing it. King it suited, definitely strong enough to open into a weaker player's big blind. Nothing. Still going to go for a C bet against a recreational who is likely to under check raise me. The less that your opponent 
check raise bluffs you or defense properly, the more you can oversee bet. Could consider jamming my hand if I knew more about this player. Like some guys will have a pure limp folding range here with this stack, and my hand really benefits from getting him to fold a hand like Jack 10 offsuit if I were to jam pre flop. But with no reads, it being the first hand, just going to play things a little more conservative. Um, really not worried about my opponent having an ace X. I think he's going to have way more hands like King 10 offsuit, Jack 10 offsuit type hands. So. Going to be quite sticky with my 8. That being said, we get probably the worst turn in the deck. 5-4 gets there, 10-9 gets there, and spades get there. Go for a check. Don't think I can do much against a bet here with no spade, especially against this larger bet. It's just... That's the worst card in the deck. All the a lot of the bluffs got there, and I have no visibility. So even if he is bluffing me with a hand like Queen Jack with one spade on basically every river, there's nothing I can do. So just fold there. If he limps, I'm going to limp behind. My hand's not great, but. Against somebody who's making mistakes, I think that I can lose less than by just folding. This player is going to have a very profitable ISO situation, but not knowing how well he takes it, I think that's fine. It's important to kind of look. Uh, Ace four offsuit. It's going to be a little too weak at the stock deck. I'd rather him be shallower or deeper for me to raise this type of hand, because often he's going to call and I'm going to whiff like this kind of board. I'm going to see that, and he needs such a low amount of equity to stack off so like he'll raise me more with the hand just like five six looking to get it in ten nine jack ten jack nine all that kind of stuff whereas if we were deeper he wouldn't raise those hands on the flop as often so i can barrel him off on a bunch of runouts Never good to see one of the recreationals leave. It's important to keep noting that this player is clearly limping a wide range, which will change how I ISO him. Queen Jack certainly want to open if this player folds against the recreational big blind. It would be a big mistake not to. A lot of your EV is going to come from playing pot in position against recreationals.
one of the, I guess, drawbacks of playing non-Zoom is that you don't always have action for video purposes, but I think that playing these games is also nice because you get more time and we can talk about more game dynamics and game flow and what we should be doing to make adjustments against our opponents as we see more hands. So far it's been pretty straightforward in that we're mainly looking to get involved with these reparationals and attack them where they're weak or potentially make a hand and build a big pot. So here I would jam any ace. Uh, I'm just going to pick up the three blinds very often. This hand's too weak. I'm going to go for a flop lead, and the reason is I don't want to check and allow my opponent to stab with a hand like jack-10 with one diamond, where he might just outright fold it. So it's a spot where you want to be thinking about potential ranges and thinking about what will your hand accomplish by betting, can you get enough fold equity, can my hand barrel effectively, can my, does my hand have equity to make a value betting hand, and all those things were yes, so very nice spot to lead. This player is opening quite a bit as well, 3x or something to note. I think my, with a jack kicker, I think that my hand is worth three streets. I'm gonna go small though to get him to continue to call pocket threes through nines, which he'll pure call, but then also he's going to have some ace highs like ace jack and ace nine and i want to give him a chance to do something stupid and then on the river i think that he has no deuces i think that he's going to have a bunch of sevens and a bunch of the threes through fives and so i just want to pick a nice sizing that my opponent can call me with all those hands It's really important to have dynamic bet sizes against recreational players. This player also looks to be recreational, just 3.4 xing off of the 41 big blind stack. So Take a note of how he's playing some of his ranges. Could have also bet half pot on the river, um, depending on how often I thought this player might fold some of those middling pairs. But he also could have just had one of the ace highs, which we got him to float too wide by betting that sizing on the turn. Here, we can no longer jam when he's got 40 blinds. Well, we might actually be able to in, in reality to what his range is. I'm going to isolate here. I isolate very wide against their recreationals, and the reason is that not only are their ranges weaker than a GTO range, but they're also going to play much worse and more passive and overfold post swap. So I'd rather just build a bigger pot with them having a weaker range out of position, and I'll just be able to bluff them with impunity. It's definitely going to open. Uh, jack three is too loose. I'm just going to fold jack three. Another thing you want to do is you want to be table aware of the dynamics between the other players. So, for example, this would be a really nice spot for me to have a very wide three betting range because the regular player is opening into an 83 VPIP player on the button. And so his range is going to be wider. And so if we get into a scenario where he's opening significantly wider and he's not willing to fight me for with all those wide opens or at least a decent of them 
then it's going to be a very good spot for me. I'm going to three bit this and I will isolate 109 offsuit against a 100% BPIP range. I'm going to get three bit here, squeezed quite a bit, but it doesn't matter. I'm also not going to get three bit quite a bit, so totally fine. Still going to go with the range bit on this board. Even though Kings is a hand that doesn't really care to do it. I'm going to start with a small bet. My opponent's not, he has a 100% range. Flop facing check raise, Kings just fold. I'm going to have my entire range to this line. My opponent still has all combos of ace-queen and pocket eights. I would also, in terms of defending, I would rather defend a queen-x with a backdoor than the pocket kings. I'd, I'd raise here with uh, ace-eight offsuit would probably be the bottom with this stacked up. Also important to understand exploitatively Overbluffed and underbluffed spots. So on this ace queen eight rainbow board, button versus under the gun, it's going to be a very heavily underbluffed spot from the out of position player. They are going to call more of their jack ten and ten nine, king ten type hands. So not a spot that you need to torture yourself and be like, oh, what if he has jack ten or what if he's bluffing me too often? It's like he might have jack 10 sometimes for sure, but he's going to have way more of the ace queen and pocket eights, maybe ace king offsuit as well, way more often. And this is a, a big part of a win rate. Like, you see me just kind of picking up some small posh, just ISOing the recreational to 3.5x. You know, I get a C bet in, he folds. Maybe I get a C bet in, he calls. I double barrel, he folds. Finding spots like that to pick up pots is going to be a big part of the win rate, not just about stacking them and cooling them, or not even cooling them, but just stacking them. Definitely want to ISO my hand against an ADV PIP player. Calls. I'm going to start with a flop bet. My opponent calls. Gonna keep betting. I'm gonna barrel this guy off. He's gonna have five, six, six, seven, ace, deuce, ace, five, ace, x. Yeah. We're gonna have to a barrel here. He's also gonna have hands like king ten and king queen with one spade. So I would not barrel if I had clubs, and this is totally fine. We have no equity. And he certainly had ace three. It's actually even better if he jams his hand like that on the turn, as what that's going to do to his range is when he calls the turn, he is going to have more of the spade combos, five, six, and four X type hands. So my river bluff will be even more profitable. Definitely going to isolate with this hand. And this is going to be one of those spots that we spoke about where we're going to expand our range to attack his expanded range to attack his expanded range.
it's also nice in a spot like this from a, a metagame perspective to not have the first time that I do this with the nuts because the first time I do this, it's always going to get credit. Like, even though Sky format me, he just is very likely to have a hand. Um, fold. Here I'm going to open just because I think players are playing too tight. And easy fold. I use the rabbit cam like a fish. I think it's actually a decent way to kind of see how boards would play out, how hands would play out. Queen nine is going to be too loose. Sixes are going to call. Queen ten, I would isolate. We face a manual size up right away. I'm gonna call sixes with a spade, but I would just outright fold a, a jack. It's important to note that this player, I'm gonna open this hand into this player. If we face check, we would definitely be bluffing our hand. And we start right full. It's important to note that this player chose a manual sizing on the flop, likely just for value. Like he could have bet the one third or the one fourth, but he sized up to 40% or whatever. So doesn't have the bluffing range there. Here, this player hasn't been playing aggressive against bet. So I don't think that we're gonna get him to induce on this ace high board with him floating wider so I'd rather size up a little bit just slightly to where we get his continuing range to put in a little bit more and his continuing range on this board is going to be inelastic. Fold this time. I'm gonna start with flop check. Turn. We definitely want to be betting. As a bluff. Don't think we need to go too big. Starts off with two thirds pot or three fourths pot on the flop. Very easy call with Jack Four, looking to get more information about his range. Checks back. I'm going to go for a small bet. I think my opponent is going to have, I'm going to call this with this recreational here, normally I'd fold. I'm going to go for the small bet here, thinking that he has enough. 6-5, six, 6-4, six, 7x type hands. Not a hand that you want to be flatting in the small blind to a 4.2x, especially when one of the players is shallower. I mean, even at full stack, it's just going to be a losing play. Your hand is not nearly as good as it might look. You don't draw to the nuts, you're out of position. He 
here, it's, I'm going to call my hand rather than three bet. I want to keep in this big blind player to make some mistakes. Rather squeeze a hand like ace jack offsuit, king queen offsuit, hands like that that have better blockers to their four betting range and do not care if they get re raised. I'm going to go for a flop donk. They're going to have a bunch of hands that will call a bet but will check back themselves. So. For example, this player is going to have a bunch of hands like queen 10, queen jack, ace queen, that will check back, 9 10 suited, etc. Turn, unblocking all the pairs, we just go large. Still going to have king nine, queen nine, ace high flush draws. We really don't want to see a diamond. Perfect. Again, I'll go queen ten for my isoing here. And river, we're going to jam. I'm blocking all the pairs. My opponent is still going to have hands like the two pair, or he might get curious with a pocket aces type hand. He also makes 6-5 of diamonds as well. Totally fine to have leads in situations where it makes sense. Not even totally fine. You should have leads in a bunch of situations where yeah, it just makes sense for your range. I think also one of the biggest edges that I think in poker exists, which is, it's not sexy, but it's extremely important, is just not punting. Like, this has been a, a relatively, you know, a slower session than I'm used to because I'm, I'm used to, you know, four tabling Zoom and there's constant action and just being okay to whatever environment you're playing in poker to not force the action to play good ranges, let the EV come to you, don't force anything. All of your opponents are going to be making all kinds of mistakes at all time. You don't have to actively go out and seek them. One thing that I see a bunch of players do is when they're losing a bunch of pots or if they're on a downswing or if they get bored or some something happens emotionally to them, they feel like they need to play more aggressive where they three bit a bit wider, they float a bit wider, and they end up just basically spewing and just giving away EV and the best player is just not necessarily even about them doing the most amazing things but more talking the other side is they, they never punt they never just do those terrible punty plays where you look at them and they're just like what, what are you doing this guy lost his mind temporarily so really important skill to have I'll end up doing one more interesting pot and then I will wrap up this live play regular table session six five with with no recreationals as a snap fold with both players calling 
if he comes close for sure. Um, I think we'll play good. I think it's just a fold. Here we're going to also make a little exploitative adjustment where if it's folded to us, we're going to raise it a little bit bigger because I don't think that this player is being aware of sizing. So rather than making my normal 3x, I would go 3.5x with a good hand. Three running the kings. I really wanted to stack one of the recreationals during this video, so hopefully this guy could have obliged me, but he did not. I'll also take a stack from this regular if you would like to four bet with queens. Be a nice way to end it as well. And the nice thing too is that we had already three bet this player with a weak hand, which we're going to get the most credit for. So the more you three bet a player, the wider their four bet range is going to be because the wider they perceive your range, which which is true in reality. So hopefully we see the queen and the queen. H6 will be called with this player's super wide range. I don't know why this player is tanking, like he's obviously bluffing. I'd open 7-8 here, but 7-6 uh, is going to be a little too weak, although this player is uh, it's only 23 hands. Play, we'll play good. I would open 7-6 if the situations were reversed and we had the recreational in the big blind and the regular in the small blind. I don't consider that pocket king's hand interesting at all, so we'll still play one more interesting hand. Ooh, with a free roll by the recreational, well played. Gets rewarded. It's always funny when you're playing the regular tables and you have a recreational at your table, you're always rooting for him to stack the regulars. A6 is going to be too weak with uh, three potential regulars in this formation. If I were to give you just a brief summary of how we would be looking to make money in these games, it's going to be to categorize players and exploit them accordingly. So you're going to have your weak, tight, bum-hunting regs. There you want to be over-bluffing them and be putting a lot of pressure on them and get out of their way when they have value. Then you're going to have a bunch of the weak, tight recreationals where you're going to want to be isolating them a ton and winning small pots against them and barreling them relentlessly and attacking their unprotected ranges. Then you're going to have the good, strong regulars and you're just going to have to battle them and play good ranges and don't make mistakes against them and whoever is better is going to win essentially in the long run. Then you're going to have your crazy aggressive recreationals and your crazy aggressive regulars and for them it's going to be about you figuring out ways to put hands into ranges that they don't expect you to and you catch them over bluffing would be my general game plan.
I was hoping this would have been an interesting pot, but doesn't look like it's going to be going to be playing a mixed strategy in the flop and out bets and checks. This hand's going to check. Doesn't really accomplish anything by betting. Facing one third, I'm just going to outright fold with the king of diamonds and without a backdoor. I'm going to have so many better hands to continue with. I'm going to play a high frequency check on that board. I'm completely uncapped. And I'm drawing dead against a bunch of his sets. And then I also have very poor visibility with my hand, meaning he's going to be able to successfully bluff me when I have that combination on many runouts. So it's better to outright fold. So here we're going to do the play that I talked about where I don't think that he's going to understand the difference of when I'm raising 3x versus 3.5x. I think you're just going to see raise because he's been choosing larger sizing. So when I have a strong hand, we put it into the larger sizing. Here I'm just going to flat, trying to let this player in. I don't care if I get squeezed, my hand can just back call. It's important to note that this player changed his sizing on this hand. Uh, before he was doing 2.5x from the cutoff, and here he min raised, so could be a sizing tell in one way or the other. Blocking the jack, I actually think I am going to bet this hand. Um, my opponent's going to have a ton of ace highs that will be check folded, and I can still barrel different turns and rivers. So, for example, one of my opponent has a hand like ace four of clubs, ace eight of diamonds, all those kinds of hands, I can just get into outright fold. Turn on the eight. Now I block ace-king and I block ace-queen, which will be his folds, uh, especially if it's a heart. So I will check my hand. And river, we have an easy fold. Think that was the interesting hand either so we will carry on We're, we won't stop until we get an interesting hand which the good thing for me is that in poker an interesting hand happens very often One thing also to make sure that you guys win right is the highest it can be in games like this is you guys should never be playing distracted. So what that means is that shouldn't be eating, shouldn't be on your phones, shouldn't be checking the internet, shouldn't be watching YouTube videos on the side, none of that. If you're playing poker and you're playing the game seriously and you're playing to win, it means that when you're playing poker, you're just playing poker. And that can be a big advantage over your competition because if they're trying to multitask and you pick up something as small as me picking up that this player was doing 2.5x and now he's min raised and if this player was I mean he is doing it with an imbalanced range and for me to figure out which part of the range it is and for me to be able to exploit him and him not knowing that he's doing that can be a large advantage.
We do not want to get squeezed here with pocket nines. But we do. This isn't as exciting as you think. This is certainly not a pure call. I'm going to call here a third of the time. Roll the fold. It's the backboard back to Papa play where you th uh, throw the basketball off the backboard. It comes right back. Got the pocket nines again. Now this is interesting. Do I want to three bet my hand? Super interesting. Tens are for sure a three bet. Nines. Just gonna flat, and I'm gonna be I'm gonna be looking to play donks again on different boards. I want to keep him in when he has um, these lower pairs. Just gonna flat here. Going to have to call one if this player bets. Uh, he can still be even value betting, pocket eights here, protection betting, 7x, etc. So, very clear call. Not thrilling in the sense of when he's not protection betting and he does have a bluff, I'm very likely to get barreled. So, when he has a hand like Jack 10, he's going to turn a queen often or an ace, something like this, and then. I'm just going to get relentlessly barreled, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to have pocket sevens and pocket deuces here as well to defend myself. Here, I'm going to make a small three bet. I'm going to pick a sizing that I don't let him fold in almost any part of his range. Very easy fold with the nines, nine spades. You really don't want to make it big here and risk him folding. Uh, he still folded, but still totally fine. I think that the vast majority of players are going to have a very, very low. For, uh, he probably, he definitely still did have a very, very low folding range to that sizing. But there's nothing I can do if when he opens. Let's say you open a hand like King Do suited. And he's going to fold that no matter what. Uh, it's just going to happen. But I see some players will make the mistake there of not realizing with the stacks that they should change their sizing preflop. And so if he made it 3, they'll make it like 9, thinking that they have to go 3x when with these stacks you need to be adjusting your sizing. Still don't consider that hand interesting at all, by the way, so we will play on. It's also, when you guys are joining a new table, to look for who's a reg, who's a recreational, and, and compartmentalize the player types. Seeing this player sit down and 3-bet to a very reggy sizing of 12 in the big blind should give you at least some clues that he's most likely a regular. And seeing this player's 4-bet size to 25 and then his snap fold just confirms that they're both going to be at least some, to some degree regulars. Like, for him to have a 3-bet range to 12 in the big blind, which is a good size, and then a snap fold means that he knows what to do with that hand and that he has a 3-bet fold type of holding. So certainly going to be some kind of regular. Let's go King-Queen. I think I, did I block a jack? No, I had a queen. All right, well, he's dead to a 10. Kind of feeling it. I'm feeling the 10 of clubs. No. Okay, here, we're gonna make a play. We're gonna go for the limp. as this player posted under the gun, and we are going to be getting ISO'd. And now we can go, he raises, he calls, perfect. And now we get the back raise. This will be the last hand of the video. Um, 
We want to pick a size that he can still re-back raise his 18, which would reopen the action. Still going to count that as an interesting hand as the point of that was to show you to use your brains, have dynamic ranges. That was a great spot to find a limp for value as with this player posting under the gun, extremely likely that one of these players isolates, extremely likely that this player calls and then we get, you know, 10 blinds or whatever it was dead. And then when we make that squeeze, we're going to get this player to get frustrated and just re just stick it in with pocket fives or whatever and just putting ourselves into a scenario where we can win the most money is always going to be a good thing. I'll play this 9-6 and then we will wrap it up. Alright guys, this was Play It Smart for another live play video. Let me know. I might keep playing, uh, just having fun. Let me know if you guys enjoy this format, playing a little bit of higher stakes, playing slower tables and less tables, and kind of talking about not just the ranges at play, but also game dynamics, what we look for, where our EV comes from, and things of that nature. They're all certainly very important things that will for sure have an effect on your win rate. Take care, guys.